Okay, so um, welcome <laughs> to our Varble Chiropractic Clinic patient orientation class. Uh, I uh, appreciate you uh, being here today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to participate in this class and to take a more active role in your own health care because this is your most valuable uh, asset. Uh, so I appreciate your, your time and effort. Um, but before we really get into the topic and, and what we're really going to talk about is what true health really is and when you've lost it, how do you get it back? And then once you do, the most important thing, once you do get your health back, what do you need to do to keep it? Because it's so much easier and more fun to stay healthy than it is to get healthy. So, but before we get into that, um, I want to tell you a little story about a patient. And this, uh, this guy, he was um, uh, a self-employed plumber. He, he was married, had a wife, um, he was a dad. Uh, he had seven kids, uh, and he, he worked hard, had to work hard, worked long hours, and, but he didn't mind because, you know, that's just who he was. He's going to take care of his family. He's going to provide, do whatever it takes. And, but since he did have to work so hard, he would often overdo it, and he would hurt himself, so like, like we all do when we, you know, work really hard on our job or around the house. But, uh, but he wasn't one to fuss. He didn't mind. He didn't complain because that's just what you do. You just take care of your responsibilities. And, uh, but, it, but it kept happening, and it, and it got so bad, he eventually sought medical care. He, he saw his medical doctor, and, and uh, his doctor you know, had a conversation with him. said, wow, you're really hurting, and, um, and these muscles are in your back are like really, really tight. So he gave him some muscle relaxers and painkillers, right? And so he took them and you know, eventually felt a little bit better and just kind of kept on going, but it, um, it happened again, which is you know, no real surprise. And so he went back, the same thing happened over and over again. And, uh, and he got kind of concerned um, uh, because it was affecting his ability to work, right? And, and that was uh, a part of his identity, that's who he was. And, but actually it wasn't just him, it was also affecting his family. Now he wasn't really ready to admit that, but you, you can't be the, the, the dad that you need to be when you're hurting and just really, really struggling. Uh, you don't have the patience, the creativity. You can't be the spouse that you need to be when your health is suffering. But, you know, he didn't know what else to do. He just kept on keeping on, I guess is the expression. And then uh, one day, one of his friends said, hey, you ever seen a chiropractor for this problem? And he said, mm, no, not really. What's that? And he said, listen, I know a guy. Come on, just get in my truck. I know a guy. I think he can really help you out. So he went, and this chiropractor um, did an exam, very much like what we do here, and helped him figure out what was the problem causing his symptoms. And uh, started working with him, adjusting his spine, and, and he was good to go. And, and this guy was a very practical-minded fella. He said, shoot, I can go now. This makes a lot of sense uh, to me. So his health improved and he was able to work those long hours and nothing was slowing down. He worked hard and his, and his business really took off. His business thrived. You know, he was able to be uh, an involved, engaged dad to all of these children and, um, uh, and eventually a great uh, grandfather. And, uh, and uh, it, it really, really uh, affected his, not just him, but his, his whole family. Because really, the thing is, it wasn't about the, the lower back pain or whatever a patient comes in, headaches, neck pain, stiffness, or whatever. Um, it, it's about living your life at your fullest. So, and, and um, I was, um, I didn't start this fella under chiropractic care, but I was able to care for him in the last years of his life and he lived to be 99 years old, right? And, uh, and he lived, this is the thing, he lived independently. He, he was able to live um, in his own house and he was able to take care of his own needs with his you know, family around just to be with him. And um, he ended, um, uh, ended up dying with dignity in his own home, in his own bed. And the reason this means so much to me is, um, that was my dad. 
that was my dad. And, and really watching what that chiropractor did for my dad and how that changed not just his life, but the life of my family, I knew that's what I wanted to do, okay? Because we all deserve to live the kind of life that he did, you know? And, and, and we do the same things. We work hard. We have a bu busy life. Uh, some of us are married. Some of us have kids. But we have parents. We have siblings. And um, so that's the reason I decided to be a chiropractor. And if I get a little bit wound up, a little bit of emotional uh, about some of these things, you understand why I'm passionate about this. And, and I do everything I can to deliver the very best chiropractic care for my patients, for their family, for their friends, for their coworkers. Because as I said before, you deserve this, just like my dad did. So I, um, I travel around the country, me and my staff, we drive all over the place, we fly all over the place. I've literally spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in training and education to do the very best I can uh, for you, your family, and this community. So that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. So let's move on a little bit. As we go through uh, this information, uh, if you have family members, friends, loved ones that um, come to mind that uh, you're concerned about their health um, and uh, uh, or you, you're aware that some health issues that they may have or maybe they're, they're not aware of any health issues, but you just feel like they need to be checked out. Keep them in mind so you can share this information with them later. Okay? Fair enough? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So one of the first questions that I often get asked in here by patients when we, you know, um, uh, evaluate their health, we discover they have some health issues, some subluxations that we talked about during our exam. One of the questions is, um, well, how do I get a subluxation? How does this start? Okay, so we're going to go through some of the uh, possible causes of subluxations. And one of the first possible causes is the birth trauma. Right? You know, they don't actually hold babies upside down. <laughs> I just thought it was a cute picture. Yeah. yeah. Um, but have you guys ever witnessed childbirth? Have you ever been in the room as a spectator? Uh, I wouldn't say I've ever been personally in a room, but um, of course... Growing up, my mom wanted to teach me things and show me things and oh, educate yes? me and stuff uh -huh. like that. So I've seen like, you know, like TV videos right. and stuff like that. Nothing well, too crucial. And, right. So, but uh, these days, you you can you can get a very um, accurate representation <laughs> of what this is. Yes, yes. So when babies are are delivered, normally they come out face down, but they can't be delivered face down because the shoulders are sideways. So somebody, the, the doctor, the nurse, the nurse midwife, or the cab driver, somebody's got to grab that baby's head and start twisting, okay? So, so the shoulders can get up and down. And, and that baby's still inside the birth canal except for the head, and it's never turned like that. And once you twist the head enough to get the baby's body turned where the shoulders are up and down, then you have to, to bend the head sideways, right? And it's often cupping with the bottom hand and a, it's called a knife edge contact with the top hand to get that bottom shoulder out and then once the top shoulder gets out the rest is you know delivered fairly easily but see there can be as much as 70 to 90 pounds of traction on an unborn baby's neck and, and does it make sense that that could possibly cause the first subluxation yes yeah in fact that happened with my firstborn child um now um, you know, usually the first labor and delivery is a little tougher, a little longer. And my wife pushed for four hours, which is a long time to get this child here. But mama was doing good. Baby was doing good. They were making progress. It was just kind of slow. So when she finally delivered him, you know, I was just like the happy dad in the room. I was ecstatic, right? Just, I got a son, you know, I'm a dad. And, and they have him on that, um, uh, that table with those french fry warming lights over top of them and and i was over there at the head of the table and i think maybe it was out of habit like i do with you right and and i'm holding his little head i was like you know i'm dad but i i kind of felt his neck and that first vertebra in his neck was really cranked over to one side and then it's kind of like the the new dad in the room left and the chiropractor came in i was like wow he's subluxated i was thinking about all that pushing and all that traction and everything 
So I went ahead and adjusted them right then. Not like I do you, okay? But, but the amount of force it takes to correct a subluxation in a newborn, infant, and toddler is about the same pressure you would use to see if a tomato is ripe. It's a very, very subtle thing at that age. Now, my second and third child, it was a little bit quicker delivery, a little bit easier like it normally is. I checked them more deliberately because it wasn't my first time. And um, they didn't have a subluxation, so they were fine. So whether it happens in uh, childbirth or not, then uh, you get a little bit older and there could be childhood traumas. You know, when toddlers are learning how to walk, uh, they're not real good at first. And they fall between 24 and 28 times a day learning how to walk. And they don't always fall on pillows. Sometimes they fall up against the coffee table or the hearth or maybe down a couple of steps into the den. And, and those can cause subluxations. Slips and falls, you know, at whatever age, happens all the time. I hear this all the time. Daily work activities. You see the lady on the left there. Um, some people get assembly line work or production work where they have to grab something on the left, do something to it, and shove it to the right. Grab something on the left, do something to it, and shove it to the right. And not just eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day. Um, or that kid in the middle, see, so that was me growing up. I grew up on my grandfather's dairy farm. We bailed a lot of hay. But here in, in Hampton County, what's the classic summertime job for a young boy in the, in the middle of the summer? Farm, farm work and also... Mm -hmm. So there's uh, prizes for correct answers. Uh, <laughs> right. It's, it's primarily watermelon, right? Yeah. We're coming up on the watermelon festival. Yeah, they grab a watermelon. Most kids are going to twist to the left because they're right-handed and then take that strong hand and shove it and bend down, grab another one, twist to the left. How many times a day? Yeah, maybe, maybe hundreds. Maybe. Yeah. And the next day, same thing, same, same thing, thing, same thing. So daily work activities, uh, playing sports like uh, church softball, something like that, lifting injuries. You know, we're getting more packages delivered to the front step from Amazon and different things. And you could look at a package. It's not real big. You're kind of thinking in your mind, oh, that's probably two pounds. And you pick it up and it's like 10, yeah. which 10 is not that heavy. But if you're thinking two, <clears throat> oh, that could be a problem. Um, poor bedding. Could a bad mattress cause subluxations? Absolutely. Yeah. You know what the life expectancy, you've had a discussion already, right? Yeah. <laughs> there was a look. Um, what's the life expectancy of a good mattress? Really, really close. I've had some guesses forever. <laughs> no, it's not. There's a commercial on TV that I actually agree with. You know, a traditional interspring mattress has a life expectancy of about eight years. It's not 100% wore out. It's about 80, so you don't get rid of it. You move it to the guest bedroom. So when guests come, they're sleeping on a really bad mattress and they don't stay. So here's my basic rule of thumb. If your job has you standing all day, you need really good shoes. If your job has you sitting all day, you need a really good chair. And if you're going to be laying on a mattress all night, you need a really good mattress. So it makes a difference. And a poor diet, a, a poor diet is actually chemical stress. And, and this is my favorite analogy for this. If you, when you left here tonight and you noticed your, your tank was empty, you needed some gas and you stopped by Exxon and you went to fill it up and you almost filled it up with gasoline. You topped it off with uh, a gallon of kerosene. So here's the question. Would it crank? And you, you can answer this one. Would it crank? Wait, so gas, right? Oh. So yes, you said yes, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is mostly gas, right? Would it run like it's supposed to? No. Not at all. What if every time you filled it up? It eventually not run. Right. Now, I'm not a mechanic, but I know why that will happen, why it's not a good thing. Because your engine wasn't designed to run on kerosene. And your body wasn't designed to run off a lot of the foods that we eat. Our engine, our body, wasn't designed to run off of hamburger helper, Betty Crocker, or gratin potatoes, um, the number two value meal, Diet Mountain Dew, and Cheetos. But that's the standard American diet, right? Have you heard this before? The, the standard American diet, the initials are S-A-D. That's the sad truth. 
Okay, it's a, this is, uh, I do a number of talks outside the office and some inside the office on various topics. And we do one on nutrition. We don't have time to dig deep into this. Um, but that's not what you're supposed to eat. So what is the fuel you're supposed to put in your body? Hmm? Nutrients. Nutrients. And that's not in, you know, um, any food handed to you through a window is not loaded with nutrients. We're supposed to eat more single ingredient foods. Okay. So what's uh, the list of ingredients on the bag of carrots? What does it say? It says ingredients. What's listed there on a bag of carrots? It's carrots. <laughs> it's one thing. And on the little a clear plastic package of baby spinach. What's the list of ingredients? Water or spinach. Just just spinach. Just one. Now, if the box of Betty Crocker or Grotten Potatoes, oh, nobody knows. You can't even pronounce that stuff. So um, there's advice. I don't know if you've heard this before. It's often been given. You're supposed to get most of your groceries from the perimeter of the grocery store. Okay. The, that's where the single ingredient foods are. These foods have a uh, short shelf life. Okay? In, in a sense, they're still alive. They're alive with nutrients, right? So the longer the shelf life, the longer the list of ingredients, generally the worse that it is, okay? Um, so, uh, so a poor diet can cause subluxations and even emotional stress, okay? Now, let me ask you this question, um, and this is a really easy question following the pandemic that we've been through. Can you literally worry yourself sick? Yeah, Absolutely. I've done it. Yeah, it happens all the time. So the thoughts that you have, they don't just stay in your head. They affect the biochemistry of everything in the body and can actually weaken your immune system, make you susceptible and allow, you can allow yourself, put yourself in a situation that you're vulnerable to get sick. Now, what about the extreme example? Have you ever heard of someone grieving themselves to death? Yeah, yeah it's incredibly sad, but it happens. So the reason I mention this is, is your health is multifaceted. You know, you could be having some health challenges in several areas, but possibly one area has really got your attention. And if you're only working on one area and not addressing these other challenges, then your, your health in that one area may not respond to care as quickly as it could if you're getting the proper sleep, getting the proper nutrition, um, taking any supplements that you may need, um, um, uh, stress reduction in all of its forms. So if you're addressing all of these areas, everything's going to do so much better, so much quicker. So from time to time, some of these topics may come up and I'll try to give some guidance and coaching in that area. So moving on. Then um, here's another cause of subluxations, you know, little accidents, fender benders. Um, now, could this, this affect the spinal health of people in the black van, the uh, black car, the white van, or both? Both. Yeah, both. In the same way, exactly? Uh, maybe different directions. Right, right. It's, it's, there'll be subtle differences. So even low speed impacts can be dangerous. And a lot of these accidents are at five or 10 miles an hour. They don't necessarily have to be at 65 miles an hour. And the reason is your body wasn't designed to go from zero to 10 in a fraction of a second. And a lot of times these effects can be delayed. A lot of times that you've probably experienced this before where you have some kind of trauma, maybe not necessarily a car accident, could be a four-wheeler, motorcycle, trampoline, sports, <laughs> and you say afterwards, wow, yeah, I wasn't really sore right afterwards, but my goodness, the next day I really was. And sometimes it's not even the next day. The, the effects of the trauma do not show up till years later on some films some chiropractor takes. So this is a big deal. Uh, even if it's, um, I've heard people say, well, I've never really had any trauma, and, and they'll sometime later mention a four-wheeler accident and they'll say, but I was on the back. I wasn't driving. Just... <laughs> that didn't count, right? right? Yeah, that counts. <laughs> so here's a brief review of spinal anatomy. When you look at a spine from the side, that's the picture on the left, there should be several curves in it. Now the, the middle curve, the thoracic curve, that's the only one you're born with. Babies had this C-shaped curve, the fetal position, you've heard this before. That's the primary curve, the only one you're born with. 
Now the, the backwards curve in the neck, that develops when, a, uh, when an infant starts gaining some strength and they're able to hold their head up on their own. Then they develop that backwards curve. And that lumbar curve in the lower back only develops when um, a, an infant starts to get some core strength and they're able to sit up on their own. You know, at first they're very wobbly. You could sort of prop them up and they sit up for a little bit and topple over. So they develop these curves. And this is one of the reasons among many that it's really important for newborns, infants, and toddlers to have their spine checked for subluxations because there's this narrow window of opportunity. If these curves don't develop well then, it makes it a real challenge later on in life. But when you view a spine from the back, that's the picture on the right-hand side, it should be really, really straight. Now, when you look at two of the vertebrae close up, in this picture, we can see labeled at the bottom the intervertebral disc. We just call it the disc for short. And there's three of them there. And they should be about 80% water, like a sponge or a marshmallow. And they serve a very, very important role. They act like a, a cushion or a shock absorber. Because if you ride an old pickup down Highway 321, you need that extra cushion in that spine. It also acts like a pivot point. A nice, healthy, fat disc is where a lot of that motion comes from when you, when you bend. But most importantly, a nice, fat, healthy disc, very hydrated, acts as a spacer. It keeps those vertebrae apart because um, between each set of vertebrae on the left and the right, there's a little hole in the back where the nerve exits, a little branch off the spinal cord that comes from the brain to every organ, gland, and tissue, and then back up again. So the thinner that disc is, the smaller that hole is, the easier it is to put pressure on that nerve. So moving on. Now, next question, what's the most important organ in the whole body? Heart. Hmm? Give me the keychain back. That's, that's not, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Do your brain. The brain. Okay, it, you it. are redeemed. You are redeemed. That was a quick answer without looking at the slide. <laughs> yeah, it's the brain, um, and it uh, controls everything. And it's um, whether or not you had like a, an anatomy and physio physiology class. This kind of makes sense because it's the most protected uh, organ in the whole body. Uh, it's surrounded by this skull, and uh, motorcycle riders know this better than anybody because what's the most important piece of safety equipment? Oh. A helmet, right, right. So, um, and uh, as I said before, it controls everything. It's gathering signals from every part of your body constantly to give your brain information about what's happening with your internal and external environment. I mean, it's, it's sending signals right now from your feet, like is your shoe too tight? Is there a rock in your shoe? Is there an ant crawling up your leg? What's the temperature in the room? Uh, what was that sound we heard earlier? And, uh, but also, what's the tension in the muscles in the back of your leg? Uh, what's the pressure inside your bladder right now? What's happening in your colon? It, what's your insulin levels, your blood sugar levels, oxygen, carbon dioxide? The list is almost infinite and is monitoring and controlling everything. Um, uh, one example would be your, your kidneys, right? You, you guys have kidneys, right? As far as, as far as you know. Um, yeah. Now, do you know how to control your kidneys and make your kidneys do what they need to do at every moment of the day? Drink water. Perfect. Okay. That's helpful. That's really important. But, but can you tell the kidneys what to do with that water? Because what they do is a lot more complicated than that. Right. But they're doing it, right? You don't really know. But they're, so how do they know how to do what they're doing? Yes, the brain, well, it's not just the anatomy of the brain, there's a software, an operating system, right? It, there's, there's this inborn intelligence that knows how to operate you, how to um, maintain, how to adapt, how to heal, how to repair uh, constantly. And um, this is nothing you can learn. I've had classes in this. You can't be taught this information you have this inborn, or it's also called an innate intelligence that knows how to operate you. And without that intelligence, there's no life. Well, you, you mentioned the heart, the heart's very important, but if the heart quit, could you be okay? 
Actually, well, yeah. Yeah, the brain, I guess, yes. Well, there's CPR. If the heart quits, you can get CPR and get it going again. Hopefully get it going again. Right. But if you couldn't, uh, could you get someone else's heart? Good. Have heart transplants. Good. Now, of course, that's a really bad day, right? But if the brain quit, if there's no more brain activity, no, no CPR on a skull. No. Have you ever heard of a brain transplant? Mm -hmm. Do you know one person maybe that needed one? Yes. Yes. Okay. Don't mention names. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Without that innate intelligence controlling, but it has to communicate well with the rest of your body. And this is how it happens. The uh, spinal cord is the second most important organ because as we discussed, is collecting information from all of your internal organs, carrying these signals up to the brain. The brain makes a decision what to do, tells us parts what to do. Uh, but on the left-hand side, it's indicating it's not just the organs, it's the muscles, tendons, ligaments, um, blood vessels, lymph vessels, um, a connective tissue, skin, hair follicles, sweat glands. Every cell in your body has a nerve component so the brain can gather information and tell those parts what to do. And it's almost completely encased in a bone. Your backbone is not a bone. There's 24 individual movable segments, okay? So um, your spinal cord would be more protected if your backbone was one solid bone. But what would be the problem with that? Good tie shoes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hard to get in and out of your car or to play softball or so it's the compromise it's a busy street right yeah yeah so um these 24 individual segments is the compromise between mobility and support and protection uh it's the weak link in the chain so and and, and i think we did this um uh during the exam uh, but it's worth repeating because it's really really important so we're going to do this as a demonstration let me get you guys to hold out your right hand Okay, and there's a nerve called the median nerve that comes from the neck through the wrist and supplies the fingers. So let me get you to right in the middle of your wrist, there's where that nerve is. So take your other hand and put pressure on that nerve. Okay, and with most people, now it's strong, steady pressure and don't let up. Okay, now most people pretty quickly can feel a little numbness, a little tingling, a little swelling in the fingers. Move your fingers slightly. There's a little bit more restriction to move right. the fingers. So what I want you to do is hold that steady pressure for the next 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you no? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and take that off. So um, here's, here's the question, and this is the toughest question of the evening. What was the problem at your fingers? Okay, but that was the symptoms you felt at your fingers. So. What was the problem at your fingers? So like some problem blood flow or, hmm. you know. Now there is, there is some uh, blood vessels, but they usually go on the left and the right, not right down the middle, just that nerve. And tendons. Mm-hmm. So the, the answer is there was no problem at the fingers. There right. were symptoms right. at the fingers. And here's where we get confused in, in this country in our traditional healthcare system. We call symptoms problems. Okay, right? So the pro there was no problem with the fingers. The problem was here affecting communication between the fingers and the brain and the brain and the fingers. So, but, but that's not a huge problem. What if the pressure was not here? What if, what if the pressure was between the shoulder blades and the upper part of the back affecting that nerve that came from the, the um, heart to the brain and the brain to the heart? Okay. Now you felt your fingers not really working right and feeling funny. Would the heart function correctly, as efficiently as it could, with that two-way communication being altered? No, there's no way. And you may or may not be aware of that. So what that interference is called is a subluxation. And there's some indicators of a subluxation that we talked about before we checked for on the exam. Uh, pain and tenderness often happens. Now, did you, when you put your thumb uh, on that nerve, was it instantly painful? No. But if you held it for 20 seconds, do you, or 20 minutes, do you think it would eventually? Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's not. 
um, inflammation or swelling, which you could kind of feel that starting already, tight muscles, and again, this is what we looked for during your exam, uh, locked joints or reduced motion, stiffness, um, and even abnormal heat patterns, which is what we measured on those tests, those scans that we did on the computer. So what the adjustment does is restore the flow of nerve energy to the body. Removing the subluxation allows the body to heal itself. That's what we're doing in here. You know, no doctor has ever healed anybody. It, the, the best we can do is look for interference to that natural innate healing ability the body has and remove that interference and let the body heal itself. So uh, we have a couple of case studies uh, about how this happens. This, uh, this is um, a patient that came in, she worked for the school district and uh, her, her neck was killing her. I mean, it, it was just all over her face. You could see it. she was miserable. Uh, her neck was really stiff. She couldn't turn it. She couldn't focus on her work. She worked with uh, little kids and she was absolutely miserable. So we you know, took her history, we did an exam, just like we do with you guys, and we did a scan. And if you see that, um, this, the graph on the upper right, that was measuring the nerves that controlled the muscles. And, and what's going on in her neck? It's red. And red is bad, red is severe, but there's also black, which means off the chart beyond the scale of the graph, okay? She was not having a problem with her muscles in her neck. She was having a problem with the nerve controlling the muscles, right? It's like the light may be out because the switch is turned off or there's, there's a break in the wire or the breakers trip. It's not necessarily a light bulb problem. Does that make sense? Right, yeah. right. so we um, designed a course of care for her. We found subluxations were happening in her neck and four weeks later, we redid that same scan, and her scan is on the bottom right. It's the same, same lady, same school employee, four weeks later. Wow. Are the nerves working a lot better in the neck there? Absolutely. Yeah, and why was it within the normal range? Now, I'm not saying I can make the same amount of progress in the same amount of time, uh, but you'll get the same level of care. Um, I have a couple of other case studies. Um, the first is William. Uh, his parents, uh, uh, wonderful, wonder pe uh, wonderful people, very young parents. This was their first child, and that child had colic from day one. Okay, have, have you guys familiar with colic? It's their 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 bellies distended. Uh, um, William wasn't eating well. Uh, wasn't nursing well, wasn't pooping well, was very agitated, wasn't sleeping well, and it, it was a, a huge concern. Again, young couple, they were certain they were horrible parents. They didn't know how to take care of their child. So they had a few trips to their pediatrician about this over a few days, and the pediatrician told them, this looks like it's a chiropractic issue. You need to take uh, your child to a chiropractor. And they said, Huh? They said, yeah, go. So they did, and they just really didn't understand what we're doing in here at all. We did an exam similarly, like we did with you, found out this child had a subluxation in his mid-back affecting the nerve that came from his stomach to his brain, from his brain to his stomach. And they weren't talking, they weren't jihawing together, and that child could just not process and digest food very well at all. Now in adults, we call that indigestion, heartburn, gastritis, any number of things like that. So we started adjusting this child um, and it cleared right up. Now, don't, don't uh, mistake what I'm telling you, we weren't treating this child for colic, we were just looking for subluxations that could interfere with function and correcting that. And it's, it's the same case with Joseph. Now Joseph came in um, with his parents. Um, his mom and dad came in for care. They were having some health issues they wanted to have addressed, but they had these three little kids. These were stair-step little boys. The oldest was in middle school, and, and this was a very active, um, uh, very athletic family. They played every sport. They played um, to win, because winning was more fun than losing. Great family. Uh, and uh, we did find some issues with their uh, spinal health. And Joseph was a, uh, was a diabetic. He was a bad diabetic. 
He had to wear one of the monitors that were constantly measuring his, his insulin levels, his glucose levels. It had an app uh, hooked to his phone. That app was connected to his parents' phone. And uh, so we had to monitor this really, really closely. So they all were under chiropractic care. Uh, many, uh, many weeks later, he had a follow-up visit with his diabetes doctor and his doctor printed out the report from the app on his phone and his numbers were, were getting better and better and better. And, and the doctor looked at the kid and he goes, man, these numbers are great. What are you doing? Are you changing your nutrition? Are you changing your diet, what you're eating? Are you, are you exercising different? And, and his mom stepped up, you know how moms do. And <laughs> she said, no, the only thing he's doing different is he's under chiropractic care now. And, and he looked back at the report. This is what his mom's telling me. He goes, well, keep it up. It seems to really be helping. And, and again, we weren't treating his diabetes. We were just correcting the communication between the brain and the body parts, including the pancreas. And then Sarah, now I don't know if you can tell from the picture, Sarah's pregnant uh, in that picture. We have a busy town tonight, right? So. You hear, the, you hear the siren, you say a little prayer for whoever's involved. So uh, she wasn't pregnant when she came in, and her lower back was killing her. She was really, really miserable. And so we had a consultation. I was taking a history, and what I discovered is she was having some fertility issues that was really weighing heavily on her heart. Her and her husband had really been trying to start a family, and they were having a lot of difficulty. She had gotten pregnant a few times and they had all ended in miscarriage. And, and she had a, a really hard time getting pregnant to begin with. And they just had done all kinds of things and me, seen many doctors, had all kinds of tests. And it just wasn't happening. And I said, you know, sometimes this could be related. Uh, I asked her if she was still, you know, hoping to have a family and, and, and she was. And I said, uh, well, I don't know if this will make any difference, but we need to get this nervous system working better. So um, this was a couple of months later, and it was uh, early in the morning. I happened to be standing up here in the front office, and uh, uh, patients had started to come in the door and gather. I had a couple of patients sitting in the waiting room, and then she came in. She went right up to the counter, slammed her hand down, and said, Dr. Ray, you done got me pregnant. <laughs> and she said it just like that. Of course, I knew what she was talking about. My staff knew what she was talking about, but there were people in the waiting room. And I said, you need to turn around and explain to these people what you were just talking about. And she, and she did, but she was just so, so happy. And again, we weren't treating her for infertility. And, and this is a common thing. This just doesn't just happen in this office. It happens in chiropractors' offices commonly around the country. In fact, Oh, I don't know if it was 10 or 15 years ago. There was, um, I don't know if the news was out of Charleston or Savannah, but it was one of these news stories. And you know how these local news stories start. It goes, um, uh, well, there may be some good news for young parents trying to, ha to have a child. You may, if you're having some difficulty, you may want to go see a chiropractor. I said, honey, come look at the news. <laughs> and so they just basically told that kind of story. And so this has happened many, many times in this office. And, and it's gotten to the point where it's not unusual for a, a young lady to come in the office. So what can we help you with? They said, well, um, I don't know, but me and my husband are, are thinking of starting a family. We just want to make sure everything's working well. Okay. And, and we're just evaluating for subluxations and correcting those and enjoying the news when they come back and tell us their family has started. So moving on. Here's a few principles of your health. Um, good health is your birthright you have a genetic predisposition towards health and healing. You're designed that way. Uh, it's kind of like if you get a little cut on your arm, is it the ointment or the Band-Aid that heals the cut? The what? Ointment? Give me the keychain back. <laughs> now, my kids uh, swore that it was the Jeff Gordon Band-Aids. So that was the only thing, and, and I told them, that's going to cause an infection. You don't want to do that. No, if you don't put a Band-Aid on a cut, it'll heal. Now, the Band-Aid may remove interference from healing, like dirt, or maybe your clothes rubbing up against it, but it's not going to do the healing, right? Now, um, now it's not just the skin that heals on its own. If you break a bone, is it the cast that heals the bone? Just keeps on 
keeps it in place. If it's out of place, or like if you get a broken rib, do you get a cast on that? No. So it will heal. It may not heal well. It may heal crooked, or it may not grow together. It may be separated. It may heal over, but not together. So the cast removes interference to the healing, but it doesn't do the healing because you have a genetic predisposition towards healing. Number two, the nervous system controls everything. It gives life and coordinates every function of the body. Um, it's been said before that you know how important something is by how long you can do without it. Okay. Now we talked about food earlier. Food is very, very important, but you could go a month without food. Okay. It's a bad month. Okay. Water is more important. You can't go a month without water. You can go about a week without any water. Okay. And air, not a week. Maybe you could go five minutes if you practice. Okay. Um, and if your heart quits, maybe four minutes. Okay. But if your nervous system stops, that's it. That's it. That's how it's so, that's how you know it's so important. And when a vertebra or a disc is out of place, communication between the brain and the body is lost. And there was a researcher out of the university of Colorado that discovered, um, it only takes the weight of a dime where that nerve exits the spine to interfere with the quality of the signal by 60%, which is a huge amount, the quality of the signal. It's like a bad cell phone connection. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to make a cell phone call from Old Sheldon Church Road. Yeah. How's that gonna work? Doesn't. Yeah, so that's what happened with that little baby and his stomach. There was a cell phone call and it wasn't happening, or, or that lady and her reproductive organs. So what we're doing is removing that pressure, restoring the quality of that communication so that natural innate healing properties go to work and help your body function and repair as good as it can. Because removing the pressure from the nerve by the spinal adjustment frees the body to heal itself. Again, that's what we're doing in here. So here's what can interfere with you getting the results that you need and being healthy. And one is putting off getting the problem checked. Now. Let me ask you about this picture. Uh, look at this picture closely. Is this roof leaking at this moment? Yeah. Whoops. All right. Whoops. The at this moment. Yeah. Is it raining in this picture? Yeah. <laughs> right. And the time to fix the roof is not when it's raining. Right. Right. Inside the house, you can't, there are no symptoms of this problem. It's only when you get outside and get a, a, a better view that you can see there's a potential problem of leaking. There's a problem, no symptoms yet. Right. Um, and it's like uh, covering up the problem. We just drug it and numb it. Like, like uh, the first doctor my dad went to and his back was killing him. What was that doctor's approach to my dad's health issues? Uh, right. Doc, I have a pain. Let me give you a pain pill. Yeah. But you don't understand, my muscles are real tight. Let me give you a muscle relaxer. But we do that all the time in this country. That's, that's the you know, primary method, okay? But you know, we do this with our health, but would we ever take our car to a shop and tell the mechanic, my oil light is on? And would you ex ever accept the, um, the strategies, let's put some duct tape over the light. It makes no sense, because you understand the problem's not in the dash. Okay? The, the light's not the problem, it's an indicator. It makes perfect sense that it would pop the hood. But we don't do this with our health. Because every other commercial on TV says, listen, for fast temporary relief of your symptoms, take two of these. Right. With that other brand, you gotta take six. But our brand, you only have to take two. So the other thing is, is missing appointments. Okay? Your care plan is a prescription for care. Um, I don't know if you guys bake like old school baking, like grandma's recipe for that uh, pink and green cake, right? Because if it says a half a teaspoon of baking soda, and if you don't have it, is it going to work out? Might not really want to. No, no. Or if it says two cups of flour, is that like a coffee cup, you know, boom? No. You sift it, you put it in, you scrape the top. It's exactly uh, a very specific recipe. So, um, uh, if emergencies come up, right? So say if, you know, we have you scheduled for twice a week or once a week or whatever it may be, 
and some emergency happens. You have a flat tire, you gotta help a neighbor, uh, and you can't make that nine o'clock appointment. We, we get that, we understand, you have a life, <laughs> okay? So just call, let us know. If you can't make it in a nine, we'll reschedule for 11 or so, or maybe that, maybe your whole morning shot. We need to see you at 11 or, 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 or two, three or four in the afternoon. We can do that. Uh, the ladies have the ability to change your appointment time, but they can't change your care plan, okay? So, uh, and also uh, that appointment time, um, try to make it if at all possible, because these ladies work really hard putting this appointment uh, sheet together for the day, and uh, we don't want you to have to wait in this waiting room any longer than is necessary, okay? Um, so the other thing is, um, we're in a hurry. You know, we want what we want, and we want it yesterday, <laughs> right? Um, and this is the slow-paced rural South, right? And we can't be in much more of a hurry. I was having this discussion with this lady in, in room one, sweet, uh, sweet little old lady, tall, thin lady, and, uh, and she pointed her long finger at me. She said, Dr. Ray, you need to understand something. I'm a microwave woman. <laughs> okay. now, now I understood what she meant by that. And, but I told her, I said, you know, it's a crock pot world, though. You know, yeah. everything of real value takes some time. So, um, and, and when, most often, when you lose your health, it's the result of a process. Sometimes it's an event, but usually it's a process. And to regain your health is also a process. And there's this certain cellular chain of events that has to happen, and it takes at least 90 days uh, for this to happen. And it doesn't matter if it's a sprained ankle, a broken bone, surgery, or these subluxations, it takes time. Uh, and this is our mission. And if you didn't realize this is our mission statement, we have it on about every wall. Um, our mission is that everybody needs to be checked for subluxations from birth until death or until you no longer need help. That's what we're here for. And if you think about it, that mission statement is not about me or it's not about this office because I can't check everybody. I think everybody needs to be checked. So if you, um, as we were talking, thinking about uh, a friend or family member, maybe somebody you went to high school with, and, but now they're living in, in Kentucky and you're close to them on Facebook and they've been telling you about some health concerns and all the things that they're doing, um, I think they need to be checked. Of course, I can't check them. I will find somebody, somebody that I would send my child to, okay? Because um, their health, affects you, even though they live far away. And we've had patients uh, many, many times that, you know, uh, they're in high school, they play sports, they get a scholarship, and they head off to college. So I find uh, a chiropractor, again, that I would send my child uh, to for them to continue care. And uh, because, you know what, um, uh, if you can tell, I love what I do, okay? Yes. I love my patients, and, and, and part of the way um, I, I feel like I can help my patients is to help the people around them. Your health affects the people around you, right. and their health affects you. And I love this community, right? So I, I don't want just, just to get one person in the boat, you know, kind of like, you know, the Titanic, you want to get them in the lifeboat. I want to get a bunch of people in the boat, and again, I don't care if it's here or some other chiropractor's office, as long as they get the care that they need. Because the bottom line is, God loves you too. And he has a mission and he has a plan for your life. And it's hard to fulfill that mission for your life if you don't have your health. Right. So that's what we're doing here. That's what we're all about. So we wanna see more people that are on board with that. So in any group, uh, that we're talking to, uh, whether maybe they're listening online or, or maybe the maybe if they're not here but friends or family members that you're thinking about, or if it's out at workshop, uh, people fall into uh, one of three categories. Now, there's the first category, um, and, and these people they um, you know they shop around the perimeter. They they eat whole foods. They uh, almost never go through the drive-through. They they just never order a Coke or a Diet Coke or whatever it may be. They uh, exercise on a regular basis. They sleep 
uh, very well. They wake up rested. Uh, they take time for themselves. Uh, they take quiet time, time for meditation or prayer uh, or however you want to phrase that. And, uh, and, and these people, um, I call them healthy, okay? So my recommendation, my advice for these people is keep it up, right? You're doing a good job. Keep it up. Uh, now, there's other people that um, maybe, you know, they work really, really hard and, and sometimes they, they uh, fail to plan their next meal. They're in a rush, you know, leaving this place, getting to this place. Uh, they get that convenience food. Uh, they find them, themselves tired uh, after that. They're really not into exercising much at all. It's just a go-go life. They're starting to have sinus issues, digestive issues, colon issues. They're taking, you know, some um, um, uh, over-the-counter medication, maybe one or two prescription meds. And, and these people are really in the danger zone, okay? And then there's the third group, and I call them the train wreck. And I can't believe I say train wreck, and then the sirens go off again. But these people, uh, their health concerns are no, are no longer just affecting them, but they can see, they can tell it's affecting the people around them. Uh, like the health concerns of my dad was affecting us as kids. Okay, so my recommendation for them is this, is, um, this happens to be the anniversary of when we opened this office. Okay, we opened this office in April of 1995. So this month, anybody that uh, you know that you think would benefit from chiropractic care or just want to find out if they have chiropractic issues, whether they have symptoms or not, they can come in if they don't have any like federal limitations with their health care program. They can come in for 1995, which is the year that we opened up because we want to lower any hurdle. We want to do whatever we legally can to help people regain their health, to fulfill the mission that they have in their life. Because there was a, a doctor, B.J. Palmer was quoted, you never know how something you may say, think, or do today can affect the lives of millions tomorrow, right? Because, you know, I, I mentioned very briefly that guy that said something to my dad. What if he did? Could you imagine the trajectory my dad's health was on if that guy never said anything to my dad? Right. What would have happened to his career? What would happen to us as a family? I mean, this is real. This happens all the time. You know? And um, this is 50 years later, and I'm still talking about this guy. I have no idea who he is. So, um, and I hope this time that we spent together is not just like informational. Uh, the last thing I want it to be is simply entertaining. I hope the, the conversations that we have started is actually transformational, okay? Because that's what happened. Because do you think I would have ever had a chance to be here in Varnville right. to have the chance to impact your life if that guy didn't say anything to my dad? So what I hope for you is whoever led you in here for care, it makes such an impact on your life that you're talking about them 50 years from now. Yeah. But even beyond that, um, someone that you refer to care, wherever it may be, has such an impact on them that they're talking about you. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's our mission. That's what we're here for. Okay. okay. So let me pass something out to you before you go. And it looks like I have a blue pen on yours and a yellow pen on yours. And uh, so this is just a little record of attendance uh, for your workshop. And so you just jot your name down at the top. And we also have this uh, newsletter that we send out uh, uh, every several weeks, maybe once a month. It's like a health tip of the day. If you want to receive that, you can just jot your email uh, down on there. You can go ahead and cut that off. And um, 